And glad to have with us this morning on our live line, Assemblyman Phil Palmasano. Assemblyman, thank you so much for calling in. Hey, Brian, it's good to be with you again. Well, the, Assemblyman Palmasano, the governor did something recently. I think you'd be on the same page with him as this. He prevented uh, far-left groups in New York City from blocking the Mother Cabrini statue from going up in New York City. Uh, Assemblyman, apparently, and correct me if I'm wrong, the uh, protesters were against Mother Cabrini because uh, they were uh, tying her to maybe uh, white supremacy or something like that. And, and Governor Cuomo said, no, 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 just the opposite. She helped immigrants come into the U.S. Uh, tell me, am, am I right on that? Yeah, Brian. First of all, I just want to say, yeah, I'm, i am I got to be fully honest. You know, I usually, sure. I'm very, I've been very critical of the governor over the past year on a number of policies. When he does things good, or that are beneficial for the area, or when he does things publicly, I I commend him. I've said that, and I've done that in the past. Um, and uh, in this case, I agree with him 100 percent on what he's doing. Unfortunately, and I don't know all the specifics behind groups trying to block it. From what I understand, there was a there was a uh, like a like a, a, a vote down in the city, and Mother Cabrini had I think the highest number of votes. And certainly, yes, yeah, she's done a tremendous. She did a tremendous amount of work. I think she started somewhere in the neighborhood of sixty-seven different charities. Yeah, I set up a bunch she, of missionary centers. Missionaries, yep. And she's an Italian American immigrant. Uh, first, it's a saint. Uh, you know, a saint in the Catholic Church. Uh, one of the saints uh, in the Catholic Church. Uh, an Italian immigrant. She's done a lot for a lot of people to help people, like I said, with the missionary centers and helping bring immigrants into the United States. So I agree with Governor Cuomo. On in, in trying to continue to put up this statute and finding a place for it, I think it's the right thing to do. It, it sends the right message. Unfortunately, I think it did get caught up in a little politics. I don't know why, because I know Mayor De Blasio's wife was on this committee. You know, started this group. I can't remember what the name of the group is off the top of my head. But initially, you know, the mayor said, "Well, no, it was never a contest." And ultimately, it was basically his wife and one other person made the decision. And they picked someone who didn't have anywhere near as many votes as she, as she did. I think it was just they, Mother Cabrini, individual. Yeah, and, my, and I just don't understand it. Just unfortunately, really, we're talking about this. This had that, but I agree with the, the governor's actions in trying to to uh, honor Mother Cabrini and, and putting the statue and finding a place in the city for the statue to go up. Because to say anyone to say she didn't do anything, she you know, especially when you talk about immigrant issues in, the, in this country going on in New York, here's someone who did a lot to help immigrants, uh, bring immigrants into our country, and then set up missionary centers. And again, a saint. In the Catholic Church. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not, that's a woman who should be honored and recognized. So I, I commend the governor on his leadership in trying to solve this issue, and, and, and I, I give him credit. Now, with the influence of um, all the AOC and uh, Greta Thunberg, the, uh, people pushing the climate change agenda, will Governor Andrew Cuomo add more wind and solar projects to New York State in 2020 than he had originally planned for. I don't know if it's more than originally planned because there's a process in place to try to get more wind and solar and more clean and renewable energy online. I think that's always been a goal, and that's not nothing that I'm opposed to. I think it's always good if you want to get more green energy. Where I've been very critical, uh, Brian, is uh, of the AOCs, and, and especially the policy we passed in New York State at the end of the legislative session, uh, the so-called Green New Deal for New York. And what I've said is, you know, yes, we should be looking to um, try to expand renewables. That's a good thing. But we can't do it uh, all on our own. We can't. New York can't do it on its own. Uh, climate change has to be addressed globally. It can't be just addressed in New York. And what will happen when I look at when you look at the statistics on this issue, and we've talked about this before, New York contributes only 0.5 percent of the total carbon emissions in the world, and just 3.3 percent of the total carbon emissions in the United States. And to say New York's going to go 100 percent carbon-free generation by 2040 is a pretty amb ambitious agenda. But I don't know if it's realistic. But at the same time, it's going to be very, very costly. There is a a study done by a, 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 an economist, I think, out of Massachusetts, who supports it, said it would cost an additional six over six billion dollars annually just to comply with the mandates and the regulations. Uh, think about um, the number of people, you know, getting carbon free uh, by 2050. You know, it's just amazing to me that you know, no more gas stoves, no more gas grills, no more gas-powered cars. I mean, how are we going to get there? 
And if you just do it in New York, if you know the bill we passed doesn't affect China, Brazil, or Russia, I mean, China just announced that they're going to expand more coal plants. I mean, that's not going to help our carbon emissions in the world. So if New York tries to do it alone, we're not going to make it up. We're going to have what they call carbon leakage, Brian, where if we have manufacturers and farmers and businesses leave New York and go to Pennsylvania and Ohio and North Carolina where they don't have as strict as regulations. You'll just have more emissions coming out of those states, so we might be uh, lowering our emissions in the state, but it's not going to have a significant impact because the emissions are going to go up. Because Like the Paris Accord, China commits the most offenses and the U.S. is supposed to make the most changes. Right, and all we'll do, and all we're going to do with this policy we pass in New York is just drive businesses and manufacturers out of out of the state, out of business. We're going to hurt our family farms even more than we already did with the like through the farm labor bill. I mean, it's just one thing after another, and it's just another mandate. There was an estimate done by one of the business groups that said it would cost the average family fifty-eight thousand dollars to convert their over to heating from natural gas to electric heating and, and, and all those conversions you have to be done in your home. Think of how much that's going to cost for families and for businesses to make those types of conversions if they really push that direction. And just it just seems unrealistic. It's just not common sense. You know, people like to heat with their homes. With natural gas, it's efficient. And the reason our carbon emissions have dropped over the past 15, 20 years, if you talk to the New York independent system operators, uh, who really is responsible for the wholesale market and make sure the grid is taken care of, uh, it's because of the introduction of nat- more natural gas. It's lowered. It's cleaner than coal and oil. Um, we've been doing more natural gas. That's better than coal and oil, but they want to just totally get rid of it, and you see that through the pol- policies that are coming from the state, uh, stopping pipeline projects from um, being developed, three of them in New York, one, the northern access up near Buffalo in the western New York, one, the Constitution Pipeline in Westchester, and then uh, the northeast supply access pipeline uh down in New York, which was going to benefit uh, growth and opportunities in New York City and Long Island, and they're stopping these pipeline projects from going through, which is going to basically uh, not allow natural gas to get through, and it's going to spike prices. We had a polar vortex in 2013. It wasn't for a lack of supply. It was because there was not enough capacity in the pipeline in the system to get the gas to where it did uh, up to the northeast, and that affects the whole marketplace. And I just think it's just short-sighted policies. It's basically catering to um, environmental groups that have no pl- no need or no use for natural gas, and it just they, it's just really short-sighted. We can we can make our environment better, but we don't have to ban nat- the use of natural gas, which is a cleaner burning fuel. We have to use it as a bridge, but just stopping projects from happening is going to be very difficult, and that's why you see these moratoriums being talked about in, in Westchester and in New York City because, of, uh, of course, the governor strong-armed these groups and make sure that they had to figure out a way to do it, which is not an efficient way to do it. It's just really complicated, but it's just another agenda. But you're going to continue to see more solar and wind, but the problem is ratepayers are going to continue to pay more and more. This Green New Deal, as they refer to it, the only thing green about it, in my perspective, Brian, is the dollars it's going to cost uh, families in Hornell and in New York State and upstate New York more tax dollars. Uh, dollars in lost jobs, uh, higher energy bills and electric bill, electricity bills because of more of this renewable, which is heavily subsidized and, is, and more costly. That's interesting that you say natural gas is the best solution and they're fighting that. Common Core uh, is an issue. It's kind of gone to the wayside as far as getting attention from the media and the general public. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us how many Common Core reforms have happened so far, and is there any more? Are there any more plans for Common Core reform now that the Democrats uh, run the state Senate? Well, I know the Common Core issue was one of the probably the most controversial, heavily debated, discussed issues we had several years ago. Uh, there has been some progress made. I think what, one of some of the things we pushed for is certainly not to get to this one size fits all agenda for all schools, making sure there's more local control. I think we've seen more of the local schools trying to have take back a little bit more local control. Uh, I think the one thing that I've been very, very critical through this whole process is this overemphasis on this higher stakes testing, uh, the standardized testing and, 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 and basically rating kids and how they do on a test. And I think it really takes away from the education of our kids, especially when you think about um, kids with special needs to you basically to determine their their placement and their evaluation based on how they do on a high-stakes standardized test to grade them with a one, two, three, or four. It basically puts too much pressure on these kids. It, it, it really causes a great deal of stress. 
I'd, li- I'd love to see us try to get away from that more. I know the state education department has tried to modify, at least in New York. Some of these tests are mandated by the federal government, but I know the state has tried to lessen that impact, the amount of tests. We have made some progress, but we still have to keep vigilant. But it certainly is not something that is ra- raised to the attention that we saw several years ago, especially when you take that control and not having parents input. And the one thing I said, I think the biggest reason that whole uh, scuttlebutt happened back then was because you basically had the education department in the state of New York basically saying, we know best, we don't need to hear from parents uh, or families about their concerns. And I think uh, you really need to make sure uh, when we're treating, dealing with the education of our children, I think there's a several key points. We need to make sure we're treating our teachers as professionals. Um, they're a, a, vital co- cogn- a vital component of making sure our, our kids get educated. So we've got to treat them as professionals, not weigh all the standardized testing on their evaluations and things of that nature. There's too much on that being put into their evaluations. We need to treat our teachers as professionals. We need to treat our parents as partners. The parents need to have an input. Our parents need to be involved in our children's education if they're going to be successful. So we have to view them as partners, not just ramming something down their throat saying this is the way it's going to be, take it. And also we need to make sure we teach our kids and letting them know that their, their, their self-worth isn't measured by how they do on some high-stakes standardized tests. So, you know, we need to teach our, keep our teachers, treat our teachers as professionals, our parents as partners, and make sure we're always elevating the self-worth of our children to make sure it's not measured by how they do on some high-stakes standardized test, which really does not measure, measure the development uh, they're making in their educational processes, especially if you think of someone with special needs, as I was saying earlier, Brian. A, a, a standardized test doesn't measure the, the, the development of that student and the child in the classroom or measure the relationship between that teacher and student in the classroom. And I think these are the things we need to continue to put focus on and continue to put pressure on the state education department to relieve some of these burdens and stresses that are put. Wait, and I want to stop you there, Assemblyman. Was, uh, you talk about uh, kids with special needs uh, getting uh, into the uh, one-size-fits-all trap. Was that something that was going on with, oh, I don't know, developmentally delayed or Down syndrome kids or other kids that they were being pressured to take all these tests that were uh, a little difficult for them to take? Yeah, these t- they're all, they were all getting tests. There might have been some modification, but not enough to really help them. I mean, it's basically they're just getting measured with this test, and it became very stressful, very agitated to, to the students and with special, with special needs. You know, there's a pressure on how it impacts their teacher, and it just really became very, very high. St- and it's really, they, that's why it's always referred to these high-stakes standardized testing. And basically, you get, when you took these tests, you get graded a one, two, three, or four. And you know, kids with special needs, they're not going to do well in these high-stakes standardized testing. No, of course not. If you have you know a severe uh, disorder, that would be a very difficult situation. I wasn't aware that uh, that was the case. Talking with, uh, and, but has that been modified, Assemblyman? No, I mean there's still those tests going on, but we're trying to try to just make sure that that pressure is not placed on them like it should be, because we've got to remember, you know, these kids are getting individualized education plans. It's, it's called an individualized education plan, an IEP, for a reason, not to be a one-size-fits-all just because Albany or Washington thinks it's the best thing. We need to make sure our, our parents are involved, the special ed uh, board, the locally earned board, to make sure our kids are getting the best education they can receive and not put them in a high-stakes, stressful situation that just makes things worse for them and just makes them go backwards instead of forward. We want, to, we want them to continue to have progress and be successful. That's a very important point. We're going to take a quick break talking with uh, Assemblyman uh, Phil Palmisano. We'll be back. We'll continue our conversation with the Assemblyman in just a moment. Once again, on the Newsmaker Show, for the last week of this year and the first week of 2020, we'll be playing from the WLEA archives of old shows with then host Kevin Dorn. We've done this for the past two years at this time of year, and we get a lot of positive comments about repeating these programs with Kevin. So we're going to talk to Charles Turk. Charles is a native of Hungary. To establish socialism, you have to overtax and tax tenfold everybody. Uh, Middle-level officers in the American Army hate Christine Mappour because she's the one that got him into Bosnia. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, her name is not popular among the junior officers. His name is Robert Farrell. He's written a biography of every president. Could never quite be sure what Jefferson was talking about. Uh, He'd say one thing and he'd do another and he would mean a third. And uh, it was confusing. But in Truman's case, he said what he thought. So join us 
Christmas week, and New Year's week to hear replayed shows of Kevin Dorn here on AM. 1480 WLEA. Mullen Factory Direct Flooring's making room for new inventory in the new year, which means you'll save more during the Warehouse Clearance Event. You get quality name brand flooring at the best prices. Choose from over 500,000 square feet of floor coverings, carpet, vinyl, hardwood, remnants, and laminate. 0% financing is available to qualified buyers. If you're planning on new floors in the new year, get to Mullen Factory Direct Floor Coverings Warehouse Clearance Event all month long at Mullen Factory Direct floor covering in almond checking in now with meteorologist rob carroll who says more snow and it's going to get colder yes indeed brian first we get the snow then we get the cold uh, we've got a series of low pressure systems that will be passing south of the southern tier one right now producing some snow across uh, parts of pennsylvania all the way down into uh, western Maryland. That system's in the process of kind of fizzling out. It's the second one that's back across Missouri this morning that uh, is going to come a little bit further north, have a little more energy, give us a better chance for some snow. We've got some clouds in the forecast for today. You may see a little bit of light snow or some flurries. Temperatures today 30 to 35. Sunrise was at 733. Sunset tonight at 439. With that second wave of low pressure tracking south of the area tonight and tomorrow morning, we'll see clouds, a little bit of light snow after midnight. Our lows will be 20 to 25. Any light snow should taper off tomorrow morning. Brian could pick up an inch or two. Temperatures are 30 to 35. We'll have clouds, a couple of snow showers tomorrow night, 20 to 25. Arctic air starts to move in Wednesday. Clouds, occasional snow showers, breezy in 25 to 30. And we may have trouble getting as warm as 20 degrees on Thursday. Brian, as that Arctic air settles across the area. Rob, can you see far ahead into the future enough to know how Christmas is going to be? Uh, Christmas Day looks pretty quiet. It looks like high pressure is going to be in control. And it actually may be a little bit milder next week. We could be talking about temperatures up close to 40 degrees by Christmas Day. Thanks a lot, Rob. You got it, Brian. Back with Assemblyman uh, Phil Palmasano. Assemblyman, there's a $6 billion a deficit in the upcoming budget. The governor's office blames this on Medicaid increases. Now, I have a question for you. The conservatives say that the new Medicaid increases are caused by the minimum wage increases passed by the governor's uh, compensation commission. I was just, you know, I was wondering, I'm thinking minimum wage and Medicaid increases. You know, a lot of these minimum wage workers uh, would be... Uh, high school, college age, not all of them, but a lot of them. Uh, how's that tied to Medicaid? Well, I mean, when the, the governor made the push to increase the minimum wage, uh, that certainly has a cyclical effect across the spectrum as far as agencies that had people with minimum wage uh, employees, you know, the, let, the, let the market determine it, the government comes in and increases the wage. Uh, and then also when you do increase the minimum wage, it puts upper, upward pressure on other wages above minimum wage, so it kind of drives that. Agenda. So, what happens is you'll see um, whether it's nursing homes, hospitals, whether it's uh, other uh, other healthcare facilities, get more costs added to them. That drives up the drives up the cost. That has an impact on the Medicaid. And the problem what you're going to see happen is the concern I have is you're going to see what the governor is talking about is basically arbitrarily going in and cut reimbursement to nursing homes, hospitals, to doctors because if you got to get some kind of control over that. But they never want to reform the Medicaid program to look at benefits that are structured that's out there and, and putting benefits above and beyond. But, yes, certainly the, the, the minimum wage has had an impact on this for all those agencies, whether they're not-for-profit to get reimbursed by Medicaid or whether they're, they're hospitals or nursing homes or whoever they, they may be. It, there, is a, there is a direct impact because it does put that pressure on, upward wage, on wages above the minimum wage, and it drives it up because of the competition, and it just basically adds more costs. And we're facing a tremendous a deficit this year, which is going to affect programs all across the state. And the other problem is that the governor pushed off a uh, Medicaid payment last year over a billion dollars. I think it was 1.2 or 1.5 or 1.8 billion dollars that was supposed to be paid by the end of the budget cycle. He didn't. He pushed it off into April 1st. So now that gets added to the deficit this year, and he'll probably look to do it again next this year. I wouldn't surprise me, but that's not that's not sound fiscal policy. That's just you know fiscal gimmicks that we see a lot out, out of the administration. You see him do it with the STAR program. You've seen it do it with different programs, and it's just. Concerning because what I'm worried about again is our hospitals, our nursing homes, our doctors who get reimbursed through Medicaid. If they're not getting the re proper reimbursement, if they're going to get an arbitrary reduction in their reimbursement, that makes it more difficult to provide those services. We could have nursing homes shut down. We could have hospitals face more of a fiscal stress than they already do. So that's a challenge, and then we have to make sure that we're on top of that. But 
can't just arbitrarily go in and cut reimbursement to our providers. That's not the way that we have to look at the structural program in and of itself of the Medicaid program and look at some of the decisions that have been made on that. Anything interesting, anything major coming up as far as legislative plans go in 2020? Well, Brian, I think it's kind of, I'm very nervous about where 2020 is going to go after what happened in 2019, especially with this um, one, one control government with the Democrats controlling the Assembly, the Senate, and the governorship. They've made it very clear about their so-called progressive agenda, which I think is a little bit more than progressive. I think it's a little bit extreme, especially when you look at the criminal justice, so-called criminal justice reforms that are start to take an effect on January, which I think or the public needs to be aware of. I just hope that the public lights up Governor, Governor Cuomo's uh, phone like a Christmas tree and tell him to delay the implementation of this criminal justice reform, so-called criminal justice reform. Do we think we're going to go to a, a no cash-free bail, no more cash bail for criminals? Uh, you think about it, especially for people, someone who comes into your home and burglarizes your home, and uh, now they're going to get issued with a parent's ticket and say, and say that uh, you don't have to get held for bail. You can just get a, you come back to court. So what's to stop them from coming back to, to your house again for people who are domestic violence abusers? What's going to stop them from coming in there? You know, I just don't know. I mean, you have a whole host of these reforms that are going on, and it's very concerning. Uh, you, if you talk to Brooks Baker or Jim Allard, they'll tell you. And I think Sheriff Allard said the, the proper analogy. It's like you're taking the handcuffs off our, our criminals and putting them on law enforcement. Yeah, it's uh, it was it was way overboard. Do you think there will be any uh, legislative pushback on that? Oh, there has been. I just wish they would, we'd stop it or delay the implementation. If you're going to put something like this in place, you really need to have the inclusion of the law enforcement, our DAs and our, our sheriffs and our law enforcement who are at the forefront of public safety. Because I think these laws have made us less safe. They're going to be more costly. We're asking people to pay more, but but they're going to be less safe by the reforms that we're putting in place. And I, I hate to call them reforms because they're mandates, and it's basically going to, going to make our communities less safe. Uh, drug dealers coming into Hornell dealing drugs from New York City, not going to be able to be a help anymore. They're just going to say, here's a ticket, come back to court. You know they're never going to show up again. They're going to send the next drug dealer in the next time, and then the next one the next time. This is not going to help our communities be any safer. It's going to be it's a disaster, and it's, I'm urging people, please call the governor's office. Tell them to put a hold on this, delay the implementation of this. Uh, we've got, this is not, there we've got Democratic uh, district attorneys, Democratic sheriffs out there who are saying this is the wrong policy for the state. It's not going to make our, safe any, our state any safer. Uh, the district attorneys have referred to this as a catch-and-release program. This is, these are the types of policies that we're going to continue to see with this, these, this majority in the Assembly and the Senate and this governorship, so we need to get pushed back. But I believe we can stop it. If, if we speak in one voice, I think all you have to do, Brian, is look back at what we did on the license plate tax and replacement fee. You remember the 75 75- Oh, yeah, years ago when they did that. Assemblyman, we do have to leave it there. I want to thank you so much for coming on. And uh, if we don't speak with you before, uh, have a great Christmas. You too, Brian. Thanks for good to be with you. Thank you so much.